Please introduce yourselves. Okay. I'll start just, uh, and, and just so Julia, you can follow suit, but um, I'm Tima Bansal. I'm a professor at the Ivy Business School, Western University in London, Canada. And I'm also the executive director of the Network for Business Sustainability. And I'm Julian Birkinshaw. I'm professor of strategy and entrepreneurship at the London Business School and also deputy dean. Lovely. So would each of you uh, speak to how you, how you define def uh, disruptions in your work for, for business managers? Okay. Sh shall I go first? Or? Please, Julian. Okay. So disruption, there's a broad definition and then there's a much more narrow definition. The broad one simply says that um, there are things changing in the business world all the time, but when those changes are dramatic in one direction or another, discontinuous is another word that's sometimes used, you know, a rapid shift up, a rapid shift down, whether this is economic, political, technical or whatever, that counts as a disruption. And that is the stuff that companies need to figure out a way of responding to. And as I say, that can run the gamut from environmental, social, technical, political, but the word disruption has been sort of hijacked in the business world by technological disruption, and particularly this notion of disruptive innovation, which Clay Christensen at Harvard managed to almost, tr not quite trademark, but almost trademark as a very, very specific and narrow case of a technical innovation, a technological innovation, which initially is actually somehow less attractive to incumbent companies because of its performance characteristics than whatever the dominant technology at the time is. But because it's on this trajectory of improvement that's very rapid, it sort of sneaks up on incumbent companies by, ac by surprise. And by the time they figured out it's coming, it's almost too late for them. And so when you talk about disruption in the business world today, most people leap into this sort of digital disruption or technological disruption conversation around, you know, is our, is our business going to be Ubered? Are we going to be challenged by a company with a new business model, typically one built on a platform, typically one built on some technology that we don't fully understand? So that's the way I usually use it. Certainly most of my conversations with executives are around technological disruption, but I do understand that there's a much broader way of defining the term. Lovely. So uh, just commenting then on Julian's point, I think my perspective is probably aligned with his first description that disruptions are disruptions in all sorts of systems and I take a systems perspective. So if one thinks about organizations as part of a larger social and environmental system, then uh, the disruption that's coming, I think into the future is happening across a range of systems. So what's happening in technology, for example, is going to change the way that society interacts with each other. It's gonna change our environmental footprints. And so, and those disruptions to society as well as the environment are gonna cascade into the larger system, which will affect technology. And so I see these disruptions as being, uh, once again, as, as Julian said, discontinuous. Um, but in a way that's going to reverberate um, yeah. through all aspects of what we do. And it could be initiated by technology, but it could very well even be initiated by some aspects to our understanding of what is science, for example. If we're disrupting what we think is evidence and science, then it starts to challenge what we know is truth. And so there's aspects of this that are unpredictable and they're happening at a systems level that has never been seen before. Partly because I think the systems, the actors in the system are more connected than we were before. And so, whereas something that happened in Japan before didn't necessarily affect us, now it's affecting, you know, it can affect markets worldwide, it can affect technologies worldwide. So uh, the interconnectedness of people and organizations make these, um, the, these changes much more disruptive than before. And I guess the point I would add to that is that, uh, I mean, you know, in academia, we call this a complex system, right? The idea is that we know that 
you know, A affects B and that B might affect C, but actually thinking through all the second and third order and more effects is impossible. It's just like any, in like a weather system. And so the point is that when we see a significant disruption in one part of that system, we can never really predict how it will play out in the coming years. And so that's why disruptions uh, are so, um, uh, so, so challenging because you know, we're quite good at extrapolating in a linear way about how things have always worked and small changes we can just about take account of. But when one thing changes dramatically, that's when our ability to, to anticipate and predict what's going to happen kind of breaks down. And, and I think what's different, not only uh, what I've said before with the interconnections, um, is that the level of turbulence is much different than what we've experienced before. So if you're in a stable system, you can get the first order effects somewhat predictable or the second order effects. But when the turbulence increases as well as the interconnections, the second and third order effects become completely unpredictable. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yep. So, um, Julian, I really liked the way you sort of contrasted the the Clay Christensen or the kind of dominant yeah. definition of disruptions um, with this broader notion, which is sort of I think what Tima is embracing. Yeah. What do you think that the business world loses out on by not? Uh, sort of paying attention to the broader sense of disruptions, if if that's it, if they're not. Um, so, I mean, business people are, you know, they're they're busy. They um, they 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 know that there's a lot of stuff happening in the world, but they they often struggle to figure out which stimuli or which signals to sort of grab onto. So, you know, they're very much sort of led by the um, Gosh, you can almost, I mean, it almost becomes almost like fad-like whereby, you know, certain thought leaders take us down a direction and they emphasize a whole set of issues. And, and, and that becomes the stuff that the business world picks up on. So, you know, it's not just Clay Christensen. Obviously, you've got you know, The Economist or The Financial Times or Wall Street Journal or whatever. You, you do find that, that the, the, the sort of progressive sort of thought leadership based media is setting the agenda for the conversations that business leaders pick up on. So, you know, the fact that we've managed to kind of shoehorn disruption into digital is both a blessing and a curse, right? It's, it's a blessing because it is undoubtedly true that these platform-based business models uh, from, the, from the Amazons and the, and the Facebooks and the Alibabas of this world are having a, a dramatic effect on how businesses are having to think differently about what they need to do. But in doing that, there is a risk that we kind of, absolutely a risk that we lose a whole bunch of other important issues, which could be important and which, which could make a difference. And it's not that they're being ignored. It's just that, you know, your typical chief executive has limited ability or limited attention span and can only really have two or three major strategic initiatives at any given time. And what I've discovered over the last, I would say, two years is suddenly this dis digital disruption thing has just come to the top of the agenda. And I, I don't know why that is. I really don't know why, because we've had 20 years of the Internet now. Right. I mean, there's every reason to think that, you know, 10 years ago, these digital issues were, were as important as they as they are now. And yet somehow, perhaps it's because of the rollout of mobile technology suddenly we've had this massive second wind in terms of energy and investment in, in thinking about digital. Uh, and, and now it's very hard to get a chief executive sort of off this topic. So, I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating slightly because, you know, there's a certain sort of self-fulfilling prophecy in what I'm saying here. If I, if I start the conversation talking about digital disruption, you know, that's what's going to happen. If Tima starts by talking about um, you know, disruption in terms of the planet and, 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 and the environment, then there's a good chance that they're going to attach themselves to that as well. So, Tima, what do you think about that? I mean, am I, am I, um, is, is my comment a little bit biased in terms of my own personal interests? Well, I, I actually have mixed reactions. So, uh, part of me agrees entirely with you that there is this over, um, no, over attention to to technology. The other part of me wonders, though, if we aren't truly seeing something, and maybe I'm subject to the same biases and attention 
myopia, attentional myopia as, as managers. But uh, I'm sure that you've experienced this, but in, I, I'm doing work in the oil sands again. Yeah. And in the oil sands, it's shifting the way that at least some companies in the oil sands are thinking about their business. And so there's one aspect of just extracting oil out of you know, the ground. Um, and so it's changing their operations. But the other part of it is that it's possible that we're going through an energy transition and that as we move from to just simply to electrification and mobility of electric cars, for example, that alone is going to decouple our reliance on fossil fuels for driving. Yeah. And given that's a lar one of the largest energy sources, yeah. it could lead to a transition. So I'm not sure that this is misplaced. Um, so yeah. May I use that as a, a segue or a ref I think if I, that's a nice segue into the, the next question or yeah. a related mm -hmm. question, which is, is this actually happening? I think one of the things that I found kind of <laughs> refreshing, the contrarian in me liked reading the, the sort of um, popular pieces that Julian had written about kind of how disruptions, at, at least at the sort of digital type may be overblown. And I think that's the balance that I hear Tima kind of wrestling with. Um, so if we think about disruptions at that larger level, and it sounds like that's kind of what, yeah. well, Tim is talking at, at the digital level as well, are disruptions happening? It, is this environment really more turbulent than what we've seen in the past? <laughs> so, so are they happening? Yes, but is it the only, so yes, but in other words, um, it's, it's said that we always overestimate the sort of the impact these things have in the short term and underestimate their long term effects. So when some new technological trend comes along, you know, we, we, we jump all over it, we predict that the sky is going to fall in, then we suddenly discover, you know, within a year or two, that the sky has not fallen in. And we tend to say, well, perhaps that was misplaced. But then the thing gradually takes off. There's, there's the famous hype cycle, I think Gardner Group have a sort of a big spike and then a, a dip and then the thing grows again afterwards. So the, the observation I made in that article that you read was that, you know, for all this talk of disruption in say banking, which of course banking, banking is the ultimate digital product. Uh, it is remarkable how resilient all the traditional banks are. The very same banks in Canada or the UK or whatever, at least on the retail side are exactly the same as they were 10 or even 20 years ago. And every time I say that at a conference, someone says, ah, but this time it's different. And my answer to that, well, you know, I wait to be proven wrong, if you see what I mean. So, so I, I see two sets of forces. One is massive disruption in terms of technology. In other words, new business models are emerging. But I also see massive stickiness or massive inertia in the system, which in banking translates into you know, none of us have probably ever changed our ba our personal bank account in the last 20 or 30 years, right? So, so you know, the old switch and cost concept in industrial economics is still valid. And you put those two things together, and quite clearly in some industries like, you know, digital photography, disruption has completely killed off the industry. And in other cases like retail banking, you actually find that the, that the, the discontinuity ends up not being a Clay Christensen-like disruptive technology. It becomes what he calls a sustaining technology. It becomes something that the banks actually embrace and use. So, so you've always got to be a little bit skeptical whenever any talk and talks about discontinuity or disruption, because first of all, every, every management thinker likes to believe that they live in a world of time of great change, right? And this was true 20 years ago and it was true 50 years ago. Just read Peter Drucker's works and you'll see he always predicted sort of the imminent demise of the system in which he lived, if you see what I mean. So you've got to be a bit skeptical about whether this time is really that different. And secondly, you've got to remember that for everything that's changing, there's a bunch of stuff that's always going to be staying the same. Uh, and we mustn't lose sight of, of those things either. Right? So, so certain, certain things are very, very different. And yet, you know, today I'm still sitting in an office which looks remarkably like the office I'd have sat in a hundred years ago, except for the computer and telephone on my desk. Tima, what you what do you say? Well, so I want to pick off I pick up where Julian just left off because, in fact, it my views sort of dovetail with his nicely in that 
uh, I agree that uh, uh, it's, it's often said that the disruptions don't happen as quickly as we think that they would in the short term, but they will in the long term. And, and then we're wondering, you know, what's going to happen in the long term. But I think that fundamentally, though, that there are some things that are changing, which was enabled by the internet maybe 20 years ago. And, and I know that this plays off of some of Julian's work as well, but I think what we're going to see some layering, if that's a word, of um, the old with the new. And we have that possibility where we didn't before. So we will see people who like local currencies alongside people who are going to be uh, working with these digital currencies that have no sense of place right. alongside the more traditional currencies of you know that we have in the banking system and that technology enables uh, this level of um, of uh, uh, what's the word that we can we can make it suitable for our own preferences or needs and we allow mm -hmm. tribes yeah. and communities to form and that that allows people to form the community that they want and mm -hmm. and so i i think that there's something fundamentally that's changing but allows um allows uh, uh, us to play in different realms of technology mm -hmm. in different realms of society in different realms of you know, even our, our, our preference for the natural environment, there are going to be communities that are complete Luddites by choice. Yeah. And there are going to be those other communities that can layer on them that will be completely global and placeless. So anyway, yeah, no, so, yeah. yeah. No, it's an interesting point because as you say, um, you know, even though the technology may be coming down the track in a particular way we shouldn't assume that the response to it will be a homogeneous one and, and and a lot of people um react very badly for example to the idea that they should be giving away their personal data to to apple and amazon and google um and other people myself included actually i'm just completely relaxed about it so i i can see that that does lead to some very interesting um yeah divisionalization within society and some of the the pressures that we see, some of the tensions we see in society today are probably a reflection of that. Mm -hmm. okay, great, so we have two remaining questions. Um, would it be okay if we, and I, I could eliminate one of them or we could, I don't know if, if people could go, I go, can go over. On, I can go on a bit longer. Long. Okay, so, so let's dive into this question of, of why people should, or why really, why companies, but also I guess why society should care about um, both categories of disruption. And I, I feel as though the, the case for why industry disruption is significant has been made in various ways, mm -hmm. but, um, but wondering kind of how to articulate the connection of disruptions to sustainability issues, mm -hmm. um, whether that's environmental or social. Well, I'll, let, I'll let Tima do that one first. I've got a particular thought which I want to come back to, but I'll go, Tima, you go, go ahead on that one. Uh, so, uh, from a sustainability perspective, if one considers sustainability that we don't comp that present gen the needs of present generations do not compromise the needs of future generations, there is something very different at play right now. And if you just take it from a purely uh, sustainability perspective, we have reached the use of our resources, our natural resources, and so there are implications on our ability to develop underdeveloped societies. And what worries me, I guess, on the horizon, and I don't want to have, you know, this dy dystopic view of the world, but that we're seeing this shift from capital uh, being sort of the facilitator of development to now being technology as a facilitator of development. And we're seeing the shift from Wall Street to Silicon Valley, this is very you know, US centric. Mm. And we don't know where that's gonna take us. And I worry in a way that if we don't, aren't foresightful, if we're not deliberate in our understanding of what's going on, that we will leave groups of people behind that we hadn't anticipated. And there's are these unintended consequences. So what are the implications is that I think that we need to have a conversation with technologists, with society and with business and those people have to be in the same room or otherwise we will create unintended consequences for sustainable development. 
Got it. So let me make an observation which builds on this, but goes off in a slightly different direction, which is the following, which is that, you know, particularly if you follow the technological disruption angle and you look at the, the Amazons and the Googles and the Facebooks, they've been incredibly clever and incredibly aggressive about harnessing information technology to do things that they believe are for the good, but without a whole lot of thought about the potential negative externalities that they are creating. Um, and, and, you know, they just can't quite see the downsides of what they're doing, but they're actually quite significant because, for example, you know, they are in many cases, shall we say, giving products away to us in return for our information information about us, which they are then using to allow them to build other products and services. So, you know, you take a company like Amazon, you know, they don't really make any money except in their web services business. Amazon's business model is essentially drive down prices and extract information from consumers and use that to allow them to move into other areas. Now, in the classical laws of kind of consumer welfare and antitrust legislation and things like this, that is a perfectly acceptable way of doing things. But the consumer welfare problem exists anyway, because if Amazon becomes so dominant that they're able to actually leverage information they've gathered from consumers and drive out you know, small businesses and whole retail shopping streets, then there is an argument that says actually that they're damaging society as we know. So, and, 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 and the kind of the key point is that you know, all of the kind of regulations and laws that were created to define what sort of business behavior is acceptable, all those, beha all those rules were created 100 years ago. Rules around intellectual property, rules around anti-competition authority, rules around the nature of the corporation, the governance of corporations, you know, the PLC, all those rules were created when we assumed that companies were these industrial entities. And now, 100 years later, we've got these, essentially these digital entities, and the institutions that govern them are just completely unfit for purpose because they were designed for a different age. And so what you're finding is, and to Tim's point about getting them in the same room, I mean, we need the regulators and the public policy people to, to, to rethink the means by which they define the rules of the game so that these digital companies understand the consequences of their actions. So there's a, there's a, there's a sort of a, a very, very big genesis of a thought in there, which I haven't actually thought through, but it does seem to me that, that we're starting to realize that we've unleashed this enormous power in these digital companies that we don't quite, un quite understand what the consequences of it will be. And I think Julie and I are very much on the same page there. And I would go one step further is that I do think that public policy can be one of the solutions to this, but given the speed at which, and I think speed is really central here, the speed at which these uh, technology driven companies are able to move, yeah. public policy will never be able to catch up because the institution of government has just been too slow. And so then we need a different mechanism for governance, a different mechanism for allowing, uh, uh, allowing us to control some of the consequences of this, societal uh, involvement. And this goes to maybe your next question, Maya, but what are the solutions? And I think part of the solutions is that we have to now build the partnerships and the, maybe the informal or formal collaboratives that will allow this to happen, because I don't think that government regulation is going to be able to move with the speed that's needed. Agreed. Yeah. No, I mean, I think I had framed that question as what should companies do, but what I'm hearing is almost more what should society yeah. <laughs> do? Yeah. So I think you're right. You've got to split that into two questions. One, one question is if you are, if you are a corporate executive, um, how do you, in your company, cope with, with disruption? Um, and, you know, I teach a course here at London Business School called Achieving Strategic Agility, Agility which is all about trying to um, build a, an organization, build a frame of mind in managers, um, build a way of working that enables 
much more rapid responsiveness to the changes that are happening around. And, and um, we can look at the, you know, the negative stories of a Kodak or a Nokia. And then you can look at the much more positive stories of, of the Amazons of this world in terms of not just the sort of the vision of the chief executives in these cases, but also the organizational systems that they've created that enable adaptability. So we could dig into an, a, a much more detailed conversation about what exactly that looks like. Um, the much bigger question is the one of society as a whole. And of course, as always, what is good for society is not necessarily the same as what's good for companies. Sometimes the job of companies is, is absolutely to, in their view, to maximize their profits at, you know, not, not an expense of, but without regard to some of the consumer welfare issues, which, which, which other people have to worry about. So, so it's a very different set of prescriptions to, to regulators and policymakers in terms of the ways that they try to steer business towards being, if, if you like, a force for good in society rather than one that creates uh, downsides. Yeah. Tima, would you add anything to that, that this notion that, that our recommendations for, com for organizations, for companies might be, for companies really, might be different than, than what we might urge society and specifically policymakers to do in response to disruptions? Uh, I, I absolutely agree with everything Julian said about that. So, but but maybe just adding on to it, that I do think that as well, there is this blurring between business and society that hasn't, maybe it's always been the case, but that um, uh, that businesses, Amazon is setting public policy to some extent. And maybe that's always true that has been true, you know, with the Walmarts of the world, for example, that they they have this because just their vast size that they have this ability to change. But I think this notion of just a level of influence that companies have now, without regard to public policy, or because there is no governance structure, that the blurring between the two is is much more significant. And I think that we have to recognize that that the boundaries are starting to evaporate. I also think too that um, the way I really like the way that, that Julian framed the question, there's two ways to think about it, the corporate level and then at the societal level. But then I think there's this shift that's taking place that companies can be just seen as receivers, which they've always been, that we are the receivers of what goes on in the world. But then there's this piece of greater agency, I think that's also mm -hmm. part of the dialogue that's important is that corporations can actually create the change that they want in the world. And when they see themselves as agents or actors of the change, then they start to shift the way the products and the markets that they pursue. Right. And so um, I think this notion of agency rather than just finding a product niche and exploiting a niche is the way that we think about business. And in the past, this is around creating the niche because niches aren't predetermined as they once were. Good. So can I just add one, one point on that, which I, I like. Um, so we talk a lot about business model innovation, right? The, the business model innovation is, is when a company comes up with a new way of selling a product or service, often on a platform. Um, and of course, it is the company that sell itself that, that is the instigator, that is the agent of change. They are shaping the rules of the game in, to their benefit. We don't give as much thought to institutional innovation and what I but when I say institutional innovation what I mean is active attempts to shape the institutions of capitalism if you like the system the system in which we work for the better and I'll just give you one example of a what I think we probably agree is a good innovation but potentially with some negatives um, for many many years the notion of 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 software development was that you owned your software. Uh, intellectual property around software was understood, copyright if you like. You know, some 20 odd years ago, um, around the time when the internet was invented, uh, the opportunity for what's now called open source software came along. But the, the problem with open source software is, is if I put my software in the public domain, if I'm Linux, let's say, and somebody else takes it, there's a risk that they take it for themselves and they protect it. So somebody had the bright idea of creating what's now called a general public license, which is a 
intellectual property regime, which says, if I put something into the common pool, a piece of software, anybody else is allowed to use it and allowed to alter it as long as they put it back into that public pool. So we're creating essentially a common pool of intellectual property. Everybody has access to this and everybody can use it in a way that benefits everybody. Now, that didn't just happen. Some, I don't even know the full story, but somebody had the, had the, the brilliance, if you like, to create this institutional innovation around property rights for software, which was good for society. And of course, you can't assume people are going to do this in an enlightened way. Sometimes they're going to do it in a way which actually benefits them. But hopefully there's enough sensible people out there that sometimes they actually do it for the greater good. So one of my current research projects, which I'm just starting, is to actually kind of go back and look at some of these institutional innovations, particularly around the shift from industrial to digital era, to say, what are the things that are changing? What are the things that need to change? Where have we got the biggest lag between, you know, what the needs are and what's happening in order to try to help to shift the public policy conversation forward? Wonderful. Okay. Well, this, this has just been fantastic. Um, I, I think it's been a very rich conversation. No, no real conflict, but you can, a good testimony is the fact you can have a good conversation without conflict. So uh, yeah, is there anything you each would like to add before we um, before we wrap up? No, what? Not for me, Julian. Yeah, no, I'm good. No, thank you. No, it was fun. <laughs>